So today we are celebrating the Vivaha, the marriage of Tulsi and Shalegram. So I'll talk about this festival's significance at three broad levels. At a universal level, at an ethical level, and at a practical or personal individual level. At a universal level, festivals are a integral part of human culture. Utsava Manava Priyaha. The Shruti say that humans love festivals. Why? Because they break the monotony of life. And in general, the daily routines of life, they tend to become, if not burdensome, then at least boring. And different people try to break through it in different ways. So if you consider, this is our daily life. Our, the daily life and the daily reality that we experience. And this inevitably becomes, as I said, boring or burdensome. And then we need to get away from it. And there are two ways to get away from it. One is to get away from it by going down to an imaginary world. And that is what is done through entertainment. That is what is done through various forms of enjoyment. Where people watch movies, play video games, forget themselves in television or go for partying and drink. So what are they trying to do? They're trying to break the monotony of life. So now, and the, now the Cricket World Cup is going on currently. Mm -hmm. So it's not just people who are sports fans and who are very active, heavily interested in sports who go there. Yes, they're there. But that sports and all the many associated what associate with it is actually an escape from reality. Because the reality becomes boring. And that's why there are people may or may not use the word festivals. They may use the word fiesta, they may use the word party, they may use the word picnic. But the idea is we seek a break. So spiritual cultures, they say, yes, we need this break. They acknowledge the need for a break. But they say that there is a higher level of reality. There is our daily material reality. And then that's what you can call the virtual reality. Virtual reality is what is imagined, either by us or by someone else, and we enter into their imagination. But there is a spiritual reality, which is eternal. So virtual reality is actually an oxymoron, because something virtual itself means it's not real. So virtual reality is like a like a brave coward. Either you are brave or you are a coward. Or it's like a brilliant fool. So it's virtual reality is oxymoron. It's not a reality, but we pretend that it is a reality so that we can get relief from our experienced reality. But festivals, especially if they are centered on spiritual wisdom and they have spiritual significance, then they give us an experience of higher reality. They remind us of timeless truths. They draw our consciousness towards higher reality. So we could say going down is escape from reality. Escape from say material reality to virtual reality. But there is escape to reality. This is an escape from material reality to spiritual reality. So festivals provide us an opportunity for that if they are centered on spiritual truths. So there's a festival of Diwali, there's a festival of uh, in different traditions, or there's a festival of Christmas. Unfortunately, many of these festivals, their spiritual significance is forgotten and they become commercialized. So then they're meant to escape to a higher reality, but they also become escape to a lower reality. So for example, for many people, in India, when there is Diwali, it's just primarily fun, food and firecrackers. That's all it is. Most people don't really think of anything higher. But festivals are meant for this purpose. To remind us of a higher reality. 
and that's why if we understand the significance of the festivals then that helps to recognize what is going on over here and then we can fulfill the purpose of the festival so tulsi shalagraham viva at one level what is going on over here tulsi is a plant and shalagram is a stone so we say okay we are we are basically marrying a plant to a stone it can seem absurd but there are things which are literal and there are things which are essential you know when we take things literally so there is a literal reality and there is a higher reality say for example we can consider say right now the world is under the shadow of this war between ukraine and russia it's not actually a war between ukraine and russia it's a war between america and russia fought through ukrainian soldiers uh, but whatever it is say if he said the white house made an announcement to attack moscow now when we say that white house it's not as a white house suddenly starts speaking and makes announcements so we understand it's not literal but it's not that simple there is a place called white house so but that when we use the word white house it there is a physical place called white house but what it represents is more than that physical place called white house so what is described is reality sorry reality is what is described by white house but what is described is also more than reality there is white house as a literal physical structure and there is what white house the white house represents what does white house represent it represents the american government especially specifically the american executive do we have a similar word for australian government here in india we have raj bhavan or in can the right said okay <laughs> not a physical structure it has the uh, uh, uk they call it downing street and things like that so anyway so white house is a common so that the linguistic term for this is metonym there is metaphor and there is metonym so metaphor means a represents b he is so he or he is as strong as a bull uh, she sings as sweetly as a nightingale that's a met that's a comparison so it's a it's a similar metaphor but when a represents b and at the same time a is less than b b is bigger than a so so we have the white house over here and we have the us government is something which is a little abstract you can't really pinpoint what's the american head of state is on the us government us government is much bigger so similarly in spiritual domain what we see with our senses it is all we can say metonymical reality that means when we have the on the altar we have the deities of krishna so yes krishna has that form at the same time krishna so krishna at one level is not different from the deity but at another level krishna is much much more than the deity the deity is at one place krishna is everywhere the deity is primarily manifested to accept our service but krishna does hundreds of things apart from accepting service krishna himself acts so there is the bhed and abhed there is oneness and difference it's like white house and us government is one but white house and us government also different so similarly the deity and krishna are one and the deity and krishna are also different and similarly when we are tulsi and shalagram so tulsi just seems to be like one plant and shalagram seems to be like one stone and yes that is true tulsi is a plant shalagram is a stone but that is not all that is there to it tulsi here represents the divine femininity and shalagram represents the divine masculinity and nature is a manifestation of these two principles all of nature works through these two binaries the feminine and the masculine and they unite and through their union procreation happens through that union species continue and through their union 
uh, existence goes on. So here when we are celebrating the vivaha, the, the union, the wedding of Tulsi and Shalakra, basically what are we doing is, we are through a symbolic festival, we are re-reminiscing and reenacting the union of the feminine and the masculine. The divine feminine and the divine masculine, which come together and are the basis of creation. So Tulsi is actually it's a plant, but it's much more than a plant. It's a stone. This is much, much more than a stone. And <clears throat> now we as a so that's the at a broad universal level. So we function at normal level of reality, say this is a plant, okay, this plant will give me some fruits, it will give some flowers, I can eat it, this stone, okay, what can I, I can use a stone to hit as someone who I'm angry with, or maybe I can use a stone to, if I want to make a building or a house, okay, can I fit in the carving, is it good to design? We have a very utilitarian view of things. Utilitarian means that what does that do for me? Hmm. But what is the intrinsic value of things? Things have their intrinsic value independent of how they are valuable for us. And this is reminded for we this is meant to be a reminder for us of that universal reality. But beyond that, there is an ethical reality. So I talk about three levels, I say the universal, the ethical, and the personal. So at the ethical level, in the tradition, in the in the world's general spiritual tradition and specifically in the bhakti tradition, in the dharmic tradition of India and specifically in the bhakti tradition. So if we consider concentric circles, this is the big circle is the world's spiritual traditions. Within that there are the dharmic traditions centered on dharma, which ethics, the right thing to do. There is like a second circle within that. And within that there is a third concentric circle or a smaller circle, there is a bhakti tradition. So within these traditions, there is always uh, the, there are stories that depict the complexity of morality. In general, if we consider, uh, we all have many questions in life. So how can I, how can I earn more money? How can I improve my relationships? How can I become more true to myself? We have many, many questions. Or we just have some more superficial questions. What the cricket score? What is who has won how many seats in the election? Or what is the stock price? There are questions like that. But ultimately, all human questions, if we take out them at an essential level, they boil down to two things: morality and motivation. Motivation means why do we do what we do? If you want to understand a person, what do we want to do? What, is, what motivates this person? You know, okay, you're having this job, you're going here, you come here. What motivates a person? So motivation is, why do we do what we do? And morality is, what should we be doing? It's two things. I'm doing something, why am I doing it? And what should I be doing? Or with what reasoning should I be doing these things? So motivation and morality. These two are what are addressed by dharma. And essentially, if you want to know a person well, there are two things. Now, what drives them? What is their motivation? And what are their boundaries? Morality, see, we could say that motivation is like the fuel. What drives a person? And morality is the boundaries. The boundaries. If somebody is going on a road, we need the fuel to go on the road then. Without it, we can't move. But then if you are going on a road, we also need to stay within the boundaries. If I have to stay on my right side, on my, on my side of the road, if I start going on the other lane, another lane, the opposite lane, I'll cause trouble to myself or cause trouble to others. So motivation is what moves us. Morality is what keeps our motion within boundaries. And now motivation and morality are difficult subjects. The So this Tulsi Shalangram Vivaha, there is a, a story which at first level can seem either just silly mythology or it can seem like almost uh, some kind of immoral story. But it is neither. 
it actually depicts the complexity that is inherent in reality. That now many people they have, to have an idea of reality as black and white. Mm -hmm. and this is right and this is wrong. And those who have this kind of understanding, their attitude towards other is that you know you you are perfectly free to express your opinion as long as you agree with me. <laughs> so their idea is I am right and you are wrong. Therefore, this is I am white, you are black. And you can speak whatever you want as long as you agree with me. Otherwise, you are a bad person, you are a foolish person, you are an evil person. So many people operate within black and white, but reality, most of reality exists not in black, not in white, but in between, in shades of grey. And how to navigate those shades of grey? That is what is depicted through the broad stories within the, the Bhakti tradition. So here, and this Tulsi the, the origin of this festival of the marriage of Tulsi and Shaligram that begins a long long time ago and the universe is described in the Vedic texts to be involving a constant battle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. The forces of good are called the Devatas and the forces of the evil are called the Asuras. So these two are constantly fighting and this fighting happens at multiple levels. It happens within our own hearts. There are virtues within us and vices within us and they are fighting. It happens at a, at a global level between communities, between countries, between religions, between ethnicities and then beyond it, it happens at a cosmic level. Now in these fights, some situations are that who is right and who is wrong. That is quite clear. We say the devtas, the gods, are, are virtuous, they are good. And the asuras are the anti-gods. So they are not virtuous, they are vicious. They are opposite and there is a fight going on. However, sometimes the moral boundaries get blurred. And why does that happen? That may happen because Sometimes the Asuras, the anti-gods, the, uh, they unscrupulously grab some powers. So the whole idea is that the Vedic universe is quite sophisticated. You understand that the gods are powerful, the anti-gods are also powerful. But both of them, they understand that their power comes from some principles beyond themselves. Just like sometimes we perform yajna or sometimes we do puja, people do rituals. So at this particular time, there was a very powerful demon named Jalandar. So this Jalandar, Jalandar, so Jala is water. Andar is one who is born from within the water. So he was a very powerful demon. And as I said, while the black and white is there in reality, but reality is not always black and white. So Tulsi, before she manifested as Tulsi, she had appeared as a beautiful princess, Vrinda. Now she was naturally inclined toward virtue. She was inclined toward devotion. And she went on to become greatly devoted to Vishnu. But like Prahlad, Prahlad was a great devotee. But Prahalad was born to a terrible demon. Who was that demon? Hiranyakashipu. Yes. So now Prahalad was born to this demon, and because of that, there is a constant tension in his life. At one side, he wanted to be respectful to his father. At the same time, his heart was devoted to the Lord. So there is dharma. Dharma, we could say, is duty in the normal moral sense. And Bhakti is the Paradharma, is the supreme religion. It is the heart's ultimate longing for unlimited love, which is fulfilled only in the unlimited reality. 
that is God, that is Krishna. So in Prahalad, there was this tension between Dharma and Bhakti. The due, his duty in the world, which is to respect his father, and his heart's longing, which is his eternal duty, to, to love and serve his eternal father. So a similar tension was there in, for Runda because she was born to a demon named Kala Devi. So sometimes there is the idea that in English they are saying that the, the fruit never falls far away from the tree. What it means is that people have children, the children are, have nature similar to their parents. Well, maybe, maybe not. Sometimes there is a storm. The tree, may, the, the tree may be at one place and then a stormy wind comes, the fruit may fall far away from the tree. So sometimes the progeny may have nature quite different, even opposite to that of their parents, of the progenitors. So Kala Naimi was a demon and Vrinda was a devotee. So there was that natural tension. Now she wanted to respect her father, at the same time her heart longed to worship the Lord. So because she was born in a demoniac family, so she, her father ar arranged for her marriage to what he thought was a very good bride, uh, bridegroom. And because he was a demon, so who did he think was a great groom for her? Another powerful demon. So therefore he got her, he arranged for his marriage to this demon called Janandar. And after they got married, she, she was always trying to balance her heart longed to worship Vishnu. And she was, she was chaste and devoted to her husband also. But this tension was there. Now, in the universe, there are many forces, subtle forces that exist far beyond what we normally perceive. And sometimes these forces come to our awakening. Say we are sitting on this floor and suddenly some if an earthquake occurs. And we never thought that there was a force which could literally shake the earth. But forces exist like that. There could be, there could be a tiny pathogen, a tiny germ can cause the whole world to stop. Who would have thought that something like this could happen? Just two or two, more than about two to three years ago. It happens. So there are forces far beyond our experience. So this Jalandar, he was a very cunning demon. What he did was that he saw that his, so there was a difference between the way Hiranyakashipu dealt with Prahla. Hiranyakashipu was very egoistic. And because he was egoistic, he wanted everybody to respect. And when Prahlad refused to respect him, he was infuriated. And therefore he tried to incinerate Prahlad. He tried to burn him, he tried to bury him, he tried to kill him in various ways. He didn't succeed. So Hiranyakashipu saw Prahlad's devotion as a threat. As an audacious challenge to his authority. But Jalandar was much more cunning. He saw in Brinda's devotion an opportunity. He saw that if she is so devoted, then what will happen is through her devotion, through her devotion, I can gain access to higher power. So he practically never opposed her devotion. He did oppose her devotion not because he was a devotee, or not because he wanted her to be a devotee, but rather he finagled, he manipulated things in such a way so that she was devoted to Vishnu and she was also chased to him. So the purity and potency that she got from her devotion, that because of her faithfulness and chastity to her husband, that transferred to him. So he was already a powerful demon, but by his wife's devotion, he became even more powerful. In fact, things went to such a level that he became invincible. And 
often it is said that behind every successful man there is a there is a powerful woman so this was literally true for jalandhar the secret of jalandhar's power his invincibility was his wife's devotion to vishnu and wife's chastity to him and all the now we may say okay is he really a demon if he is letting his wife practice bhakti and no but he was not satisfied no he was he was greedy for power he was opportunistic see the most dangerous villains are those who don't look like villains because if somebody looks dangerous you know if you're walking on a dark street and somebody you know maybe somebody has uh, you know a big mustache and they have hair protruding out and they have a giant body and they're carrying some knife and a gun is this person a thief or what is it but if a person is dressed in uh, <clears throat> dressed in a suit and tie and tie and that person is having a smartphone and that person seems to be very respectable person and that person has the intention to rob us so what happens is if a person doesn't look dangerous but that person has a dangerous heart that makes them doubly dangerous so jalandhar was like that his heart was wicked but he did not manifest that and he heard that she was consort parvati was extremely beautiful so he decided that i want her just as ravan desired lord ram's consort sita so he desired her and he had already provoked the demons he was already arrogant he was already powerful he had become invisible he had started not just terrorizing human society dominating the demoniac society but he had started also plundering the world of the gods the heavenly worlds and then he went be, even among the world of the gods there are multiple levels it's like in a government you know we have we have like assistant minister then we have ministers and then we have prime minister so like that there are there are administrative gods and there are the primal gods so he had overpowered the the administrative gods indra and others but now his reach his overreach went up to shiva and he tried to take both shiva's wife parvati for himself and he heard that she was about kailash and also very beautiful so he thought i want that for myself he tried to dislodge shiva from there at that time lord shiva he fought with jalandhar but though he fought with jalandhar you know, he he was very powerful and jalandhar fought fully jalandhar could not defeat lord shiva but neither could lord shiva defeat jalandhar the lord shiva was joined by the various devtas and jalandhar was joined by his asura associates his anti cult associates and there was a fierce fight but it seemed to have no end and that was because jalandhar had got this blessing of invincibility nobody could defeat him as long as his wife was devoted to vishnu and chaste to him so dharma so sometimes in this world the right thing has to be done but the right thing cannot be done very easily to do it easily sometimes we have to do things which may not be so right krishna says in the bhagavad gita that sarva rabha hi doshena dhume agni vibhavataha that sarva rabha hi doshena every endeavor is covered by fault so there are two broad conceptions of morality one is categorical morality categorical means this is the category of right this is the category of wrong and that is all there is to it and the other is contextual morality contextual morality means yes this is right this is wrong but you have to consider the context in what context are we talking so most people recognize that categorical morality it doesn't work sometime or other they start recognizing that but they may just gravitate towards not caring for morality at all so 
when i was in school i studied in india in a christian convent school so i had this idea of categorical morality this is right and this is wrong so in our school we didn't have like direct bible classes but we had like additional classes would be we would read the bible and biblical stories and uh, other stories so at one time i read several books on the importance of being truthful and then when i was in my 10th standard the matriculation exam was there so at that time i had started studying way earlier history was one of my favorite subjects so in the first month i had completed studying the full history book and then the teacher who was teaching when she, she was teaching i was a little bored because i had studied everything i knew everything that she had told so i was yawning and the teacher asked why are you yawning so something within me told me that maybe i should be careful but my default was categorical morality that what is correct this is right this is wrong so what is right be truthful so i said why are you yawning sis i am bored so her eyes just blazed in anger sis why are you bored she says that you know i know everything that you are teaching How arrogant can you be? And then she asked me some questions from from a future chapters. I answered all the questions. That incensed her even more. And then she took someone me out of my class and took me to the principal. And she took me to the principal. And then I said, "The principal, what happened?" So I was known to be among the brighter students. So my principal was a little surprised that I had been summoned to the uh, that the teacher's office. What happened? So I told her what happened. He said that. Why did you speak like that? He says, you know, in in this school only in moral science I learned that we should be truthful. So he says, did your parents teach you any manners? He said, yeah, my parents taught me manners, but you taught me to be truthful. <laughs> so yeah, I I just it says the story. They got so angry. The principal got so angry. She called my Mother, my father was out of station, and my mother said that. She, she, I told her what had happened. My mother was furious. She said that yes, being truthful is important, but you also have to be tactful. You know, you have to be respectful. So you don't, you you can't come off as if you may speak the truth, but the truth is going to hurt others. Then the truth is make going to make people think that you are arrogant. that speaking truth is important but speaking truth is not the only important thing so this is that's when it struck me later on when i studied the bhagavad gita and i studied ethics krishna says anudvega karam vakyam satyam priyatam jayat krishna says speak truthfully but speak non agitatingly speak pleasingly so in 7050 krishna talks about that if you consider to how we should speak that to ask speak truthfully and speak tactfully both are important So, if there is categorical morality, this is right and this is wrong, then we may end up doing the right thing, but it may have the wrong effect. In that case, I was not, I was not showing off. That was that is not my intention. I didn't take it consciously, subconsciously. I may have it right, but so when we consider what is right and what is wrong, we may think of it in the category. This is right and this is wrong, but actually. that contextual ethics means what is right cannot be determined simply by the content of the action we also have to look at the consequence of the action what is going to be the result and then of course so we need to go context context means what comes after and what comes before so when we are doing something what comes after is the consequence what comes before is the intent so categorical morality means when we are deciding what to do we consider our intention we consider our action we consider the consequence of our action and based on all these three considerations then we decide what we should do so <clears throat> so so vishnu now decided that janandar because he was exploiting he was exploiting tulsi for her own purposes and he was not even So Tulsi was very devoted to him. 
But Jalandhar was not devoted to Tulsi. No, Jalandhar was out searching for other women. So he realized that well, Vishnu decided that he has to break through the invincibility that Jalandhar has that created for himself. And so Jalandhar was on the battlefield. Now Lord Vishnu was not on the battlefield at that time. Lord Vishnu was not fighting, but the various devutas were fighting and Lord Shiva was fighting. So Lord Vishnu came to the place where Vrinda was staying. And Vrinda when she was staying, she was performing sacrifices and doing puja. She was worshipping Vishnu, but she was worshipping Vishnu for the protection of her husband. And at that time, when Vishnu saw there, Lord Vishnu himself was in a dilemma. So Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that I atandritaha, I am very conscious about my duty and I do my duties well. So Krishna considered uh, Krishna Vishnu, they are the same person. So Lord Vishnu considered what is the right thing to do over here. And he decided that both what would be good for Vrinda and what would be good for the world, for the whole universe in fact would be to stop Jalandhar from his reign of terror which was coming from his exploitation of the power of Tulsi, of Rindam. So then he took on the form of Jalandhar and he took on the form of Jalandhar. At that time Rinda was performing puja and she looked at Jalandhar. She thought it's her husband. She immediately got up and she came to him and she offered her obeisances to him. She touched her hand to his feet. And as soon as she did that, so there is in the traditional culture the chastity at various levels. So as soon as she touched him and her feet, uh, touched his feet, in the mood that he's her husband. So what happened was her vow of chastity was broken. We know in the Ramayana, when Ravan abducted Sita, and then after that, Hanuman went to Lanka. And Hanuman said, I can carry you back right now. But Sita said, no. No, I don't want to be touched by any other man. When Ravan abducted me, I was helpless. But let Ram come and let Ram rescue me. Let uh, Ram release me. So Hanuman honored her desire. So what happened was, as soon as that chastity was broken, on the fight, Shiva attacked Jalandhar. And Jalandhar died. And now this fight had been gone, going on so fiercely. And Lord Shiva shot arrow with such ferocity that Jalandhar's head flew from the battlefield in the heavens and it flew down to the place where Lord Vishnu was with Vrinda. And Vrinda saw to her horror her own husband's head. She looked at that head and then she looked at Vishnu. She says, who are you? He says, who are you? So at that time, Lord Vishnu revealed himself. Now, Vrinda was mortified by that. She was conflicted. She was deeply afflicted. On one side, the same Lord whom she had worshipped for since her early childhood, that Lord had come in front of her. So it was, at one level, the fulfillment of her heart's greatest desire, this great joy. But then, on the other side, she felt that, how could he have done like this? How could he have caused me to give up my chastity? And when thinking like this, she was mortified. So it was an intense emotional conflict within her. And thinking that her dharma she had violated. So she used all her power to curse Vishnu. She says, you have acted with a stone heart. You have acted in a stone hearted way by exploiting my chastity. Therefore, may you become a stone. Now, Lord Vishnu is all powerful. He does not have to accept anyone's curse. The, any everyone's power, all of everyone's powers come from Lord Vishnu. Now, when, see God, some people have a different idea of God. You know, God, they say that, okay, 
I am like if you consider tennis competition, there's a player who is maybe 100 rank, then the player is 70 rank, there's a player who is 25 rank, and there's a player who is number one rank. So it's like a hierarchy. It's a hierarchy, and the number one player is at the top. So some people think that God, there are various living beings, and God is the best of all beings. God is the most powerful, like the top ranked tennis player. But it's not like that. You know, that today who is the top ranked tennis player can get defeated, and somebody else can become the give the top player. So God is not just the best of all beings; He is the basis of all being. He's the basis of all being. All living beings exist by His arrangement. Everyone's power comes from him. And that is why when Hiranyakashipu asked Prahlad, the whole universe trembles in terror on seeing me. And how are you not afraid? By whose power are you not afraid? What is the source of your power? Now what does Prahlad reply? Does anyone remember? What does Prahlad reply? He says, the source of my power is the same as the source of your power. In fact, the source of my power is also the source of the source of your power. So the source of Brahma, Hiranyakashipu has got his power from Brahma. He says, Brahma gets his power from Vishnu. Now here, Prahlad is not just being cheeky. He is not just, saying, not just reminding his father. You know, where did you get your his father's? Where did you get so much money from? He says, You think if you're asking where my money came from, your, your, your money is not your money, it has come from someone else. He may seem to be disrespectful and cheeky, but he's not being cheeky over here. He's actually telling him a spiritual truth. The new the picture verse he says, Vishnu is not the enemy of anyone. It is only because of our, our uncontrolled and misguided mind that we think that Vishnu is our enemy. But he is the well wisher of everyone. So, nobody can be in competition with God because our power to compete itself comes from God. So, that's why God is not just the best among all beings. He is the basis of all being. Everyone's power comes from Him. So, Jalandar's power comes from Vishnu. Lord Shiva's power to slay Jalandar comes from Vishnu. Vrinda's power of her chastity which is protecting Jalandhar also comes from Vishnu. So through this action, the, even Vrinda's power to curse Jalandhar uh, Vishnu who also comes from Vishnu only. So Lord Vishnu does not have to accept anyone's curse. But he recognized and acknowledged that Vrinda had felt hurt. And therefore what he did was he accepted her curse gracefully. And then Vrinda felt so mortified that when her husband's last rites were being performed, she entered, she immolated herself. And at one level, this might seem like a very ghastly story. But at a deeper level, you know, if we look at many of the stories in the Vedic literature from only the perspective of one lifetime, they can see they can see the tragic or horrific or just having all kinds of a twisted storyline or twisted morality. But if we look at it from the perspective of many lifetimes, what was happening was, Vrinda was trapped in a situation where Dharma and Bhakti were pulling her in opposite directions. And through this whole arrangement, what the Lord did was, He freed her from that entang entanglement, from that entangled situation. And then, when she immolated herself, from that fire, a miraculous thing happened. Normally when a person dies, then when a body is immolated, it just gets reduced to ashes. But in this case, suddenly from that funeral pyre, a, a, a plant came out. And that plant was Tulsi Devi. So, some people say, what is this, you know, that she had to, that she had to, why did she have to immolate herself, why would she, why would Lord Vishnu violate her child? all, this is all immoral, or this is all mythological. Okay, if we're considering, 
it to be mythological, then just reject everything. If we want to accept, then we have to accept it entirely and understand the story in its own terms. So this story is involving many powers beyond what we normally perceive. The idea that somebody dies and from their funeral pyre, from the cremation, a plant comes out, that itself is mystical. So the other aspects of the story are also mystical. So we focus not on using our our moral lens to look at that story, but to look at the story from the tradition's own moral lens. And what the tradition is demonstrating over here is that Lord Vishnu, he freed Tulsi from her entanglement, freed Vrinda from her entanglement. And through this arrangement, so Lord Vishnu was cursed to be a stone and that stone became Shalikra. So, normally when the Lord comes as an avatar, He comes and stays for a short while. He stays for a short while and He goes back. But as Shaligram, He is always there. And Shaligram and Tulsi, they are eternally united even in this world. So, their union of the Lord and His consort eternally happens in the spiritual world. But in this world, at least in that particular case, Vrinda had by her family obligation been married to a person who was opposed to her Lord. So her union with Vishnu was not possible in that lifetime. But although it was not possible in that lifetime, the Lord arranged for it to happen eternally. And so in this sense, here, Lord Vishnu sacrificed his adherence to morality. He deceived Vrinda who was very very dear to him. And Vrinda sacrificed her chastity. And they did both of this was a sacrifice for a higher cause. What is the higher cause? Protecting the world from the demoniac force of Jalandhar. And when the Tulsi Shaligram Vivaha is, ce is celebrated, it is not there is moral, below moral is immoral, but above moral is transmoral. Transmoral is what is transcendental to normal moral principles. That is why is it transcendental? Because there is a higher purpose. Normally, all of us we drive, we drive within the speed limits, we stop when there is a red signal. And that's how we are meant to function. If somebody goes faster than the free speed limits, one time a person was pulled over, you know, you are going too fast. This person said, no, if I had been going too fast, you would not have been able to catch me. <laughs> so, the point is that, so people are just cheeky, they just neglect rules. But suppose there is an ambulance and there is a person who is about to die. If the ambulance is going, then the normal rules of red signal, they are put aside. The ambulance goes above speed limits, there is an emergency. So the ambulance is breaking the rules, but that is not considered a violation of the rules. So there is something which is violation for selfish purposes and there is violation for a selfless purpose. So what violation for a selfish purpose is immoral. Violation or going beyond the boundaries of rules for higher purpose is transmoral. So this story is a story of transmoral, moral action. And that sacrifice is commemorated through the, through the union of Tulasi and Shalikra. So this is the ethical significance. And the third part, I'll speak briefly and I'll conclude, that is the personal or the individual significance. Tulasi at one level represents the universe, the environment, nature. And Vishnu represents the Lord of nature. So, uh, at one level, this particular union, it, re it reminds us of the sanctity of nature. The sanctity of nature that we nowadays are becoming more and more aware of how much we have damaged the environment by our indiscriminate industrialization and commercialization. We are developing environmental awareness. Even atheistic scientists are recognizing, are acknowledging that we tell people don't damage the environment. But 
people don't listen. So what we need for that to really change people's action is that we need to infuse people's understanding of nature with a vision of the sacred. That nature is not just utilitarian. Nature exists out there for our exploitation. No, nature is inherently sacred. And why is nature inherently sacred? Because she is the energy of the Lord. She is the eternal consort of the Lord. So here, this particular ceremony, it signifies. So when we come and we participate in Tulsi Shalagram Viva, what are we doing? We are uniting nature with her Lord. We are reminding ourselves that nature does not belong to us. Nature belongs to the Lord. The mother, nature is like mother. The mother profusely gives to her children. But that does not mean that the children are meant to exploit the mother. So, so nature gives her gifts bountifully to us. But if we exploit, then that will become the product. So the tree Tulsi is just one tree, but that one tree is like a microcosm of the whole environment. And when we worship Tulsi, when we offer water to Tulsi, it is a symbolic ritual where Tulsi represents the goddess and we are serving the goddess in the appropriate way. And she manifests as a plant, we serve her by offering a few drops of water to her. But what it signifies also is that human energy needs to be used to harmonize with nature, not exploit nature. And that is an invaluable reminder for us in today's world that we need to raise our consciousness. We need to refine our consciousness to see nature as sacred. Many people who are environmentally conscious, they talk about how do we take care of the environment? They talk about three R's. They talk about <clears throat> Reduce, reuse, recycle. Reduce your consumption. Reuse what you are having. And then if you can't reuse things, then recycle things. So that they don't just, they are not just become an environmentally non-biodegradable waste. But beyond these three hours, there is a fourth hour that is required. That is revise. Revise our vision of nature. Without that fundamental vision of the, our vision of nature, we will not be able to sustain the care of nature. Otherwise, we may just shift. Nowadays, there is a shift from, say, <clears throat> coal and others to solar panels. And in one sense, it's good. But actually, when we shift to solar, all that we are doing is the solar panels, when they have to be made, so they are made using coal. And an enormous, they are made in China using an enormous amount of coal. And after that, when the solar panels get destroyed, or when they, they are no longer functional, they are not very easily biodegradable. So we just by changing from one, one energy source to another energy source, just by that mechanical process, we are not going to solve the environmental problems. We need to re raise a human consciousness and that comes by revising our vision of reality, especially revising our vision of the environment. And that is what is offered to us by the uh, a reminder of that is what is offered to us by the Tulsi Shalagram Viva. So I'll summarize. I spoke today about the significance of the Tulsi Shalagram Viva at three levels. At a universal, at an ethical and an individual level. At a universal level, I talked about how the, it may seem just absurd. We are performing the wedding of a tree with a stone. But what do the tree and stone represent? It's like the White House represents, the White House is real, but White House also represents some bigger reality than the US government. So that's a metonym. So like that, the DT is real, the DT also represents a far bigger reality. That is the all-pervading Lord. Similarly, Tulsi is real, it's real as a, she's real as a plant, but she's also the divine feminine. And Shaligram is the divine masculine. And their, their marriage is actually the, the reenactment of the of how the cosmos functions through the union of the masculine and feminine and then how is why is shaligram the divine masculine or tulsi the divine feminine for that we went to the ethical aspect the story so 
the story can seem simply mythological or immoral, but that's only if we have a superficial vision. So in the conflict between the gods and the anti-gods, sometimes the most dangerous demons are those who don't act outright immediately. They put on a facade of good to fulfill their vicious agendas, evil agendas. And that's what Jalandhar did. Unlike Hiranyakashipu who tried to destroy Prahlad or at least destroy his devotion, Jalandhar used his wife Runda's devotion to empower himself and to make himself invisible. And she was, she was both chaste, devoted to the Lord and chaste to her husband. She was doing both her duties, her dharma and her bhakti. But Jalandhar had no respect for, no regard for bhakti. He was opposed to the Lord and he had no regard for dharma also. He had an eye for Lord Shiva's consort Parvati. He was not, he was not faithful to her, his wife. And then, in order to stop his menace, Lord Vishnu had decided to break the chastity of Nanda. And for that purpose, it was, it was a sacrifice from both sides. Lord Vishnu, he is God, he is the supreme moral prince, he is the supreme morality personified. But he demonstrates that morality is not always categorical. This is right and this is wrong. It is contextual. I talked about how you can't, my exam, my example, you can't just be truthful, you also need to be tactful. So what is right has to be decided based not just on the action that is done, but why it is done and what is the result of it being done. So Lord Vishnu, he considered what will be the good, good for the world and also good for Prinda. She was trapped where her heart's longing and her familiar duty were pulling her in opposite directions. So by, by taking on a garb that broke her chastity, Lord Vishnu freed her from that trap and freed the universe from the menace of Jalandhar. Although from one lifetime's perspective, this can seem ghastly that she, she, she himself immolated and she was cursed, she cursed with Vishnu. But from a multi lifetime perspective, from a broader perspective, she was liberated from her so that situation. And mystically, that her self immolated form emerged as the goddess, as the plant to the sea. And Lord Vishnu appeared eternally as Shaligram. He is the, he's not just the best of all beings, he's the basis of all beings. He doesn't have to accept anyone's curse, but he graciously accepted that curse. And so, that indicates how ethical triumph is sometimes very complex. It's not black and white in this world. But beyond that, when we have this Tulsi Shalagram Viva, it also represents Tulsi is the environment and she represents the environment and Shalagram represents the Lord. So when we perform this ritual, it can remind us of, remind us to infuse our vision of nature with a sanctity. That nature is not just functionally useful for us, it is inherently divine, it is sacred. And for sustain, environment sustainability, we need, we need not just reduce, reuse and re recycle, but also revise. That fourth R, revising our vision of what nature is and what nature is meant for, that is the path to environmental sustainability and that makes this festival relevant even in today's world. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions or comments? Yes. So, talked about how nature beings inherently divine. Yeah. So, um, commonly people might, you know, they might go to a world in a beautiful natural place and say, oh, this is all divine beauty. Scientists also talk about the laws of nature. So, the uh, laws of gravity and things like that, and equal and opposite reactions, and you study physics. And is that all also divine? Uh, you know, the, the, the laws by which. Okay, good question. Yeah. So, if we talk about the inherent divinity of nature, then scientists talk about the laws of nature. Are they also divine? 
yes and no. Yes means that basically, uh, okay, let me start with no and then I'll go to yes. So, see, sometimes uh, the the way, now I don't want to use essentialize all scientists as atheists, but let's talk about the non-theistic world. So, science itself is neither theistic nor atheistic. Science is non-theistic. So, that means when science tries to explain the world, it doesn't consider God as an explanatory factor. When Newton saw the fruit falling, the apple fell, some people say on his head, some people say in front of his head. And Newton believed in the existence of God. But when he wanted to understand what made this apple fall, so the answer he was looking for was not God. He was looking for an explanation on another level, at a mechanical level. And that's how he came up with the law of gravity. So of, now he of course considered that the laws of laws that cause the planets to move in their orbits, which is the principle of gravity, that had a divine origin. But the point is that science, when science looks for explanation, at least science the way it functions in its mainstream version, it is non-theistic. Intrinsically, it is neither athe theistic nor atheistic. Scientists individually may be theistic or may be atheistic. Or even scientists may be non-theistic, they don't care about God. So most of the founding scientists, whether they talk about Pascal or Kepler or Kelvin, all of them were theistic, quite strongly theistic. Many of the, many of the aggressive scientists today are atheistic. So what has happened over the years is that when Newton saw that, that there is God as the ultimate causal explanation for everything and gravity as an immediate causal explanation. So things can be explained at multiple levels. So for example, right now, here the air conditioning is on and we are feeling comfortably cozy. Some of us are a little cold, but none of us feeling feeling uncomfortably warm over here. So well, now why are we comfortably cozy? Because it's because the air conditioning is on. That's one explanation. But another explanation could be that, you know, uh, Australia has got sustainable power resources or at least they have got enough energy reserves and that's why even if there is an international fuel crisis still we have fuel over here. That is also a valid explanation. So the same thing can be explained at multiple levels. So what has happened is for the founding scientists this level of explanation that nature functions according to laws this and nature functions according to uh, nature functions according to the plan of the Lord. These two explanations were just explanations at different levels. And both were both were compatible at their level. So, but over a period of time, as science through its law started explaining more and more things, so there was, you could say, overconfidence among some scientists. Or to put it another way, that scientists who were atheistic they started using science to propagate atheism that means that this particular level of explanation that nature functions according to laws they said this is the only level of explanation there is no other level of explanation at all and thus so what was to just use more philosophical terms so if this answer is not complicated enough, I'll make it more complicated. <laughs> that is, that science works on what is called as methodological naturalism. That as a methodology, science looks for natural explanations of natural phenomena. When apple falls, science doesn't say that, okay, God made it fall. When somebody gets a disease, science doesn't say that, okay, maybe the God causes the disease because of some past bad karma or a curse or something like that. Science looks for a germ, what caused that disease. So methodological naturalism. And that's valid. Even Ayurveda, which is a Vedic science, also is methodological naturalistic. If there's a disease in the body, try to see if there's an imbalance in the bodily, bodily driving substances and how to rebalance them. So methodological naturalism as one worldview is fine. But from this, science went on to what we can say as metaphysical naturalism. Metaphysics is the nature of reality, philosophy. 
They started saying that naturalism is all that exists. This level of explanation is the only level of explanation. And there's no other level of explanation, not only necessary, but no other level of explanation is even valid. And actually, metaphysical naturalism cannot be proved by science. Because science can only look at material reality. If God exists or if God does not exist, there is no way for science to either prove or disprove it. Certain indications can lead to the inference about God, but you cannot directly prove the existence of God. So, when this happens, when the methodological naturalism shifts to metaphysical naturalism, that's when science gets distorted into scientism. Scientism is scientific imperialism. You know, when the imperial rule was there, and you say most of say Australia was also industrial India were at one time ruled by Britain. So we are the only right and everybody has to go down to us. That is imperialism. So when science becomes imperialistic and it says we have a monopoly on all knowledge, we have the monopoly, our worldview is the only level of explanation, no other explanation is allowed. So the laws of nature, now coming back to your specific question, that Om Purna Madaha Purna Midam. In the Ishopanishad, it says that the Supreme Lord is complete and everything that comes from Him is also complete. So therefore the universe is complete in itself. And that's why if somebody wants, they can just be satisfied with this level of explanation. However, if they are deep thinkers, yes, this is one level of explanation, but this is not the only level of explanation. So this arrangement, the laws of nature, their arrangement is made by the Supreme Lord. In that sense, the laws of nature are also divine. However, within the worldview of scientism, of, of metaphysical naturalism, the laws of nature are seen not as having, as being sourced from God. They are seen not as an emanation from God, but they are seen as a substitution for God. So there are atheist scientists who say, okay, what is their idea of God? God exists everywhere? Well, gravity exists everywhere. The scientists, if they ask them that, atheistic scientists, if they ask them, where did the laws of nature come from? So they say that laws of nature are co-eternal with existence. When the moment existence comes up, laws of nature come. But from where do they come? No, they just co-eternal. So basically, if you see how, how they explain it, they just shift all the attributes, or not, all, not at all, the major attributes of God to the laws of nature. And then, that's how they are not actually rejecting God, they are replacing God with, the, with nature or specifically the laws of nature. So in that sense, if so this is the worldview, that in their understanding, the, the laws of nature are not they don't see the laws of nature as divine sense of sacred. They just replace God and they make the laws of nature as, as the ultimate reality. That's why I said it's yes and no. The laws of nature are, are, are sacred in the sense that are, are divine in the sense that they come from the divine. But if they are seen as a replacement for the divine, then, then that attitude towards them is not an uh, attitude which will help us to foster divine consciousness. So, does it answer the question? Thank you. Okay, do we have time? Okay, maybe I'll answer it brief. Yes, please. Can you speak a little loudly, please? Yeah. Okay. Good question. So Spinoza and uh, Einstein had a more of a pantheistic vision of divinity. How they conceived it. So yes, within the Vedic tradition, even in the Bhagavad Gita itself, the divine is conceived at multiple levels. So, so, so sometimes there is an evolution in the conception of divinity. So there is, 
uh, pantheism is everything is God, basically. Right? Pan is all. So then there's another conception of God is polytheism, that there are many gods. Then there is monotheism, there is one God. Beyond that, there is monism, which is we are all God. But the, the Bhakti understanding, the Bhagavad Gita's understanding, it includes all these levels. There is this pantheistic vision, for example, when Krishna shows the universal form to Arjuna. The whole universe is seen as sacred. It is there. And there is polytheism. In the sense that Krishna says that there are many gods and they all get their power from me. There is monism. Where Krishna says that there is that all the gods come from me. There is, there is sorry, there is monotheism. Then there is monism. Where Krishna says that the all-pervading Brahma is, is what is worshipped by some people. And those who worship that Brahman also attain me. So all these conceptions are accommodated within the Bhagavad Gita's molding. However, the Bhagavad Gita has, if you want to focus on its ultimate conception, rather than saying that there is only one God or we are all God, the Bhagavad Gita says that there is only God. And we are not separate from God, but we are not one with God also. We are His parts. Mamai Maam Shoji Valoki. So our existence is not, we are individuals. In that sense, we are separate from God. But we are individuals who are eternally linked with God. And because we are eternally linked with God, constitutionally, we are His parts. So in that sense, it's not a complete otherness. There's not a big difference between us and God. We, are, we have divine attributes because we are parts of the divine. So the, <clears throat> the pantheistic understanding of God generally is relatively acceptable for people uh, much more easily than other understandings of God. Say the idea of God as a person is a little more difficult to accept. So the Gita talks about, yes, Gita accepts it. That is also one level, if one, one appreciates divinity at that level, that's good. And that there are, within the broad Vedic tradition, you can say that there are two approaches to theology. There is rational theology and there is revelational theology. Rational theology is that we use our reasoning faculty to try to understand the theology is the study of God, to understand the nature of God. And revelational theology is that what there is a so rationalists we use our intelligence to go to understand the nature of higher reality. That's a, that's you can say the bottom up approach. Revelational theology is more of a top down approach. So by rational theology also we can discern some attributes of divinity. But if we want to know a more complete picture of divinity, then we need revelational theology. So, by no amount of rational theology can we ever come to a conclusion that God is a bluish black cowherd boy who plays a flute and the of the peacock feather. No. We can infer that there is some divine organizing principle, the way Einstein and Spinoza talked about it. We can go beyond that and we can go into the nature of reasoning required for that. We can talk about how within this universe there is consciousness. And then a consciousness signifies personhood. There is a sense of I-ness whenever there is consciousness. So, if the universe has consciousness and personhood, then its source, it's also reasonable to infer, has consciousness and personhood. And that way we can say that the ultimate reality is not just an all-pervading existence, but it also has consciousness and personhood. So that way we can make some inferences about the nature of divinity. But the personal attributes of divinity, they come not by rational theology, but they come by revelational theology. Thank you. So thank you very much for your thoughtful questions. And uh, we'll, we'll have the Aarti now.